Hello and good Thursday to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here on another episode of the Double Digit Hockey Show here on ASTBproductions.com. You can also catch the show Fridays as an encore on the YouTube channel, Double Digit Hockey. Go ahead and check that out as well. This week on the show, we got another returning guest. We did this a few weeks ago with uh, Peter Klein. Now we've got a guy who on my personal YouTube page is number two overall on the most viewed show. So I had to bring him back. He is the producer and co-host of The Quack Report. Nate Thomas joins me. How are you, bud? Good, buddy. How are you? I am good. I was going through my YouTube trying to think of, well, who do I get on the show here? And then... Probably stunned as you are. I was stunned to learn that you were number two of my all-time views. So congratulations on that. You just have only 87 views to go to catch Peter Lombardius. So uh, we'll see if we can beat that today. Um, what's been keeping you busy in this offseason so far, Nate? Not very much going on anymore, but there was a very big, busy July around the National Hockey League and around hockey. What's keeping you busy now, though? Uh, honestly, work. Um, I've been working <laughs> two jobs this summer. It's been seven days a week. Uh, I guess we're recording on the Tuesday, so I'm at day Crazy. 16 of 18 straight. And wow. I did a stretch of 23 before. So basically from like July 1st until uh, what would it be? August August 19th or August 20th. It'll be like only three days off for me. So, But you know what? I got a nice like week and a half off coming up here and that sort of thing. So it'll be nice to finally, you know, kind of be able to catch my breath for a second here. But <laughs> now those who watched the last time you were on the show would have seen your Jersey wall behind you. It's different looking now than the oh, last it's very time different I saw it. <laughs> I have to have to mention that. I have to say, I love the San Jose shark up there. And I love that St. Louis blue one sitting up there as well. Uh, beautiful jerseys that he has. And my, I got rotation going on, but Nate has a really good collection going on. So I had to, had to mention that there. Um, Last week on the show, we started this preview around the Pacific Division. We're going to continue on that, but the NHL gave us a nice, juicy topic that I want to start out with here. Tuesday, they announced that they are going to allow a small three-inch ad on the front of the jerseys. This is a polarizing topic on Twitterverse, on your, U your Facebook and YouTubes. What says Nate about a small ad on the front of the jersey? I'm like, oh man, I'm 50 50 on it. You know, as long like, you know, the size that they've laid out, you know what? We can make that work. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. From, you know, we were just talking about jersey collections and that kind of thing. I don't want to have to be buying jerseys personally that have, you know, say like I buy a new Flames jersey and it's got, you know, the Scotia Bank branding on it. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not, like, I'm hoping that's not really the case. Um, and I have seen it with the, uh, the PLL. I bought a couple jerseys yeah. uh, a couple months ago of the, the Chaos and the brand new Cannons. And, you know, they got the massive Ticketmaster logo on uh, yep. the lower back. So, like, I'm hoping that, like, you know, for retail-wise and that sort of thing, that's not going to be a thing. But we'll see what happens. I think the NBA does, like, you know, a certain levels of their jerseys. They yep. won't have branding on it. Or, like, the market, like, the, the sponsors are that. And, you know, as you kind of get higher up or something like that, then they'll add it. But, um, but yeah, so at least from the retail side and being a jersey collector myself. But, you know, it totally... It like it makes sense from, uh, you know, the league standpoint, the teams trying to bring in money and that sort of thing, especially with this pandemic that we've had. You know, teams lost yeah. a lot of money as much as you know. Yeah, they're still making millions of dollars, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> their their levels were so much different that you know we we might be kind of paying for it actually as fans for the next little bit when it, mm -hmm. whether it's our yep. ticket prices or whatnot, and you know even add that for uh, for us Calgary area people because was it in four years we're gonna have the brand new building as well so then you're gonna have another mm -hmm. markup on those tickets like that <laughs> um but like in the long run it'll hopefully help to keep ticket sales and you know like you know even just like fan gear maybe just a little bit down because they have that additional revenue stream my thing is more what happened similar to what with the helmet ads last year mm -hmm. you know at first it was like okay like i'm in terms of the uniforms, I'm very much a traditionalist. I'm not a huge fan of like, you know, the European like ads everywhere. Yeah. But so it was like, okay, we we have the helmet ads. They're at least subtle for the most part. And most mm -hmm. most worked well. Kind of 
a couple like like a, a couple examples that didn't work as well for me would be like you know Bridgestone on the Nashville Predators helmets. It's mm-hmm. more just like you know if they did like a color correction to kind of match everything and yeah. not make it so obvious, I guess. But yeah, I know that also doesn't work the same way for <laughs> you know branding and marketing purposes. But just to kind of flow with the uniform a little bit yeah. more nicely. And you know, like for the for the Calgary Flame, it worked perfectly because Scotia Bank was already you know red yeah. and white, it blended perfectly. But Scotia Bank was also the helmet sponsor for the Toronto Maple Leafs, which are blue and white. And suddenly you had this red decal uh, on their helmets, so yeah, it didn't it quite weird. work as well. I don't know there, why. But... I don't know why teams like that didn't go with just the black and white decal. Yeah, exactly. Like even that would have worked a little bit better, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just I'm kind of 50-50 on it because I can see the benefits of it for both the teams and hopefully fans. But I also just see how slippery of a slope this is going to be. Because like, yeah, sorry, as I was kind of talking about, like, you know, we had the helmet ads and it was like, okay, but and the NHL is like, we're we're probably not gonna, like we're not going to be touching the jerseys. And then sure enough, we're like not even a year later after that announcement <laughs> was made, yeah. and it's like, yeah, we're going to have a small ad on the jersey. And that's probably going to work great for, you know, teams and owners because they're going to make the additional revenue. And it's going to be like, OK, yeah. well, can we sell more of this then? And there's going to be another little patch and another one. And then like my my hope is that it doesn't turn into the European jersey, too, but yeah. it's more once like the helmet ads kind of put a crack into that dam. How quick is it until the whole thing goes out? right and everything just floods in so i'm a little skeptical but i can see the benefits of it so like i said kind of 50 50 on it and that's fair enough i've seen that take a lot on on twitter and i i understand that one the one i don't understand is those going off the deep end with this of how atrocious this is and i love the jerseys i love the crisp jerseys i have a few hanging behind me you have a few hanging behind you you know you look at that little hurricane one behind you behind me there and they've got that western hockey league patch and i like in what we're gonna see with these advertisements to that patch there it's noticeable but it's not drawing your eye away from what you're looking at so this isn't going to affect the game of hockey in and of itself yeah it is a revenue stream and i think it was um nielsen from the from uh, tsn radio he mentioned it the best words like if someone offers you two thousand dollars to put a logo on your shirt you're probably gonna do it and just just you're not going to turn down revenue. So it's an interesting conversation and a polarizing conversation going both ways. I understand both sides of it. I personally am not bothered yeah. by it, but I'm also a European soccer fan. I'm used to the big, <laughs> massive advertisement on the middle of the jersey. So it's uh, it's nothing yeah. for me. So <laughs> there, uh, there was something that I was coming across on Twitter that, you know, maybe would soften the blow even for myself a little bit. And there was the example of the World Cup of Hockey from 2016, and they had the SAP, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, sponsor or that. It was just on the shoulder. It did clash with some of the colors, like for example, Team Canada. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, it was yeah, it wasn't on the on the front of the jersey, right? Like you think of a jersey and like what you're normally looking for. You're normally yep. looking for the front, whereas you know the shoulders are normally for you know like a secondary logo, just something like yep. in the kind of that three inch range. So. If it became something that honestly you had one on the shoulder, that would actually ease it a little bit more for me, even yeah, though I, like I wouldn't hit it as much, at least to start. So, yeah, I like that idea. Actually, that's, that's not that's a neat idea. Didn't think of it that way. Um, perfect. Let's move on here. Let's let's talk about the meat and the potatoes that we came here to talk about, and that is well, last week with uh, Audie James, we went through the Western Canadian teams and a little bit on Seattle, what he saw. We want to do the same thing here with the California teams. Now, Nate being part of the Quack Report, we're going to start with your bread and butter. We're going to start the team that you help cover, that you have a podcast on. It was a quiet offseason for the Anaheim Ducks so far. Uh, Gets left back. They took care of their UFAs and come to Mahura's back. Max Jones, what do you make of the offseason for Anaheim? uh i mean it's exactly as you described quiet it's been so hard to try to you know cover and just think of things to talk about luckily we've been taking most of our august off honestly from the show because there hasn't been a whole lot there's been Mm -hmm. the get slab signing which we talked about the day of there's been a couple rfa signings in comtois Um, i'm trying to think of the other two right now it's been just mahura and max jones there you go thank you and uh and we signed our top three picks from this year that's kind of it like there's and the the frustrating thing as well is that anaheim just doesn't really put out a whole lot of information in Mm -hmm. general either whether it is you know 
off season or smack dab in the regular season, right? You don't hear a whole lot as to no. what's going on. You really have to look to some of those beat writers for any kind of information. Um, but yeah, so honestly, like out of the notes that I have here, which in this series seems ridiculous considering, you know, you pulled me <laughs> on for the ducks. They're the team I have the least about here. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Like my, my two points are, yeah. Signing gets left to the one year, $4.5 million contract, which at least it's only for a year. I did feel like it was a little heavy. That's big. We'll get the, there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, realistically it's like, it's, it's half of, you know, what his last contract was. He was getting paid $90 million a year. Yeah. So it's nice to gain 4.5 million, but that's still a hefty amount for a 36 year old. That's pretty much going to be doing a farewell tour at this point, I would think. Um, and yeah, just those few RFA signings. And I have, I have here as a note, not much else. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so, good, you note. know, like I know a lot of ducks fans and even myself to a point, I can see why it's not happening and I'm a little frustrated with it, but you know, Bob Murray is still there as the GM Dallas Eakins is still there as the head coach. They did make some, uh, you know, some other decisions on their, uh, their assistant coaches and whatnot that should hopefully help a little bit, but mm -hmm. Yeah, those two guys in Murray and Eakins, uh, even more than the players themselves, frustrated Ducks fans so much. The amount of times that you would see like the hashtag of fire Murray and that kind of stuff. And like, you know, I was even willing at the start of the year to, you know, give it a chance and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But just seeing how the season went and like, I know the expectations weren't high, but it's, uh, it's basically like, honestly, the Ducks season was, uh, that meme of the person holding up the cardboard sign of like, man, our expectations were low, but holy f, like. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, yeah, I don't think really anybody was looking at the Ducks sitting in 30th spot out of 31 teams mm -hmm. uh, initially, just because you know there were some guys that you know could have helped and did the best they could, and John Gibson and uh, you know Kevin Shattenkirk is definitely not the player that he was, but he still is a serviceable player at yep. least. And, um, you know, Adam Henrique fell off a cliff for quite a while. The guy was even waived at one point in yeah. the season in February there. Like you're sorry. What now? Um, you know, Ricard Raquel was, you know, he was still putting up points, but not quite what he has been in the past and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, when you have Max Comtois leading the team in, I believe goals and points, um yeah he led the team with 16 goals there's not a whole lot of offense going on so yeah it was a uh, it was a rough year and just a quiet off season basically for the anaheim ducks neither of us have a lot of notes but i have found some talking points to talk about the ducks sure they went into that entry draft and of course we know what a jumble that was but i think they were the one that shocked everyone first they went out and drafted mason mctavish at third overall for you, how surprising was that pick? And then secondly, in your eyes, what does McTavish bring to the Ducks organization? Uh, I was actually kind of happy with that pick, honestly, because that was one of two guys that I talked about on the Quack Report when we were doing kind of our draft preview and that sort of thing that I would have liked us to select. So I was very happy with that. Uh, you know, the guy is a uh, brilliant, like, offensive gifted kid and uh, has a great release and everything like that. And honestly, like, you know, what we were just, talking about a little bit there mm -hmm. with you know the goal scoring like when your leading guy is only 16 goals you are desperate for goals i think it was only like off the top of my head four times maybe that this duck scored more than three goals this season in a game mm -hmm. so this team is like it, they are desperate for yeah. goal scoring so um yeah so you know that was a that was a perfect guy i think to bring up uh or and to bring into the organization and uh hopefully bring back some of that goal scoring to the to the club I like that they picked him because a lot of people were liking his game into what we saw in a young Ryan gets laugh. So gets yeah. laugh back in the fold. You got McT McTavish. Don't think he's going to make the team this coming season. That's not a bad transition to make for there. The Anaheim ducks were also one of those teams rumored in this ongoing saga that will never end. I'm convinced of it in Jack Eichel in your opinion, your eyes and what you've heard, how likely is a package for Jack Eichel? And if that comes to fruition, what can Jack bring to Anaheim? Now, I think more of the question is, is Anaheim willing to give yes. up what Buffalo wants? Because Buffalo, it sounds like, is wanting a lot of futures. Mm -hmm. Now, Buffalo sat 31st last year. Anaheim was only one spot above them. 
Jack Eichel would be amazing for the team as you know i've already beaten over the head that they need (laughs) offense and it could definitely help with some center depth like imagine honestly like your top three you can kind of weave in uh two of the guys like kind of wherever even put them on a line together a la you know dry sidle mcdavid not Mm -hmm. to that level but like zegris uh comtois and eichel that could be a dangerous middle for that uh for that Mm -hmm. club um, they definitely have the, you know, the future pieces, um, but I think it makes it harder that, you know, they've been pretty adamant. It sounds like that uh, Drysdale and Zegris are off the table. They are mm-hmm. non-starters. So you got to work with everything else you have. Maybe this draft does help a little bit with that, though. Um, I, but I feel like at the same time, though, for the Anaheim Ducks, if something were to happen for Jack Eichel, it would have been before the draft and it would have included that third overall pick. Mm-hmm. So, you know, could still surprise us. Bob Murray is a guy that, you know, will is he's very patient and almost to an unnerving point <laughs> for fans. Patient. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, but, you know, like he seems to be able to get something eventually so you know maybe he is still just quietly pulling the strings uh backstage don't exactly know what's going on he could surprise us honestly but um you know just kind of taking a look and kind of knowing you know if you know what is it vegas calgary and anaheim kind of being the three front runners it seems for mm-hmm. jack eichel just anaheim kind of put themselves in a spot of not wanting to give up certain guys that are that future for them mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's going to be a little bit rough in that sense because both Anaheim and Buffalo are looking to do the same thing and that's rebuild yeah. and, uh, you know, become competitive again, honestly. So I bring them up with the Jack Eichel conversation because you've seen my tweets. They were my dark horse to get Jack Eichel. And so self-serving, I hope I'm where I'm right there. Uh, as a flame fan, I hope I'm very, very wrong. Um, <laughs> John Gibson carried the mail for the Anaheim Ducks. He was literally the team last year. What he did was the result for the team. He's got to do it again in the, as the rebuild goes along. He lost his longtime running mate in Ryan Miller. What kind of help can he expect in goal this season for John Gibson? Uh, he can expect – why do I keep getting their names confused? Uh, <laughs> Anthony Stellars. I – Man, the amount of times that I've accidentally said Alex Stalock on the Quack Report is <laughs> man. If, yeah, honestly, if if there were if it was like a dime for every time I said it, I could buy another jersey for the wall. Um, <laughs> yeah, on, but yeah, he'll have help in Anthony Stellars, which uh, you know, take a look at their stats last year. A little bit less games, but um, Stellars was an improvement on Ryan Miller. You know, Ryan Miller is definitely you know aging and that kind of thing, but. Stolarz put up great numbers and the team actually looked confident in front of him. I uh, also, and Stolarz looked confident um, kind of reminding of John Gibson a little bit actually, mm-hmm. but a little bit more. Oh, how did I describe this out there? I guess. Whereas like John Gibson is similar to a carry price of like, everything is, you know, it's mm-hmm. there. There's the calmness and that sort of thing. Not to say that uh, Stolarz doesn't look calm in there, but uh a little bit more to like a kipper, right? Like where he's just, right, yeah. he's just, he's moving, scrambling. he's flowing and that kind of thing. Not, not, not quite battling. scrambling, but he like, he's, yeah, he's battling. battling. Exactly. There, there go, you yeah. go. So that's a, yeah, it's a great way to put it. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think Gibson's, it's going to be harder, I think, because they're going to try to potentially implement a tandem thing. And that's not what John Gibson has been used to since he mm-hmm. uh, joined the ducks. Right. Um, outside of, you know, battling with Freddie Anderson. That's yeah. really it um so it's going to be interesting there that's that and that's just a thought that i think they're going to do with the tandem thing it Mm -hmm. makes sense um obviously gibson is going to get a little bit more of like more starts than stellars but it'll try to be a little bit more even um at least i would hope so because you take a look at his numbers last year yeah like you said the guy was the team he played so many games way more than honestly he should have and you know if uh, it's, it's it's easy to say if you were the make, one making decisions. Oh yeah. You just do this. But like uh, it's he's, Oh geez. I'm sorry. I'm jumbling my words here. Um, I would not have played him nearly as much as uh, he did last year. You took a look at the start of the season where um, like he put up, I think it was like two or three shout outs in a five game span. Like the mm-hmm. guy was amazing, but he got tired. 
and you could see it in his play like and it was physically and mentally the amount of times that you know there would be a goal scored on him uh just something from out front that kind of screwed everything up and the guy would just look up to the rafters and you could just see it in his face of like get me out of here like almost <laughs> like Kibersoff and uh playing for finland what was that i think the 2006 olympics he was just yeah. wanting to get pulled like yeah. the amount of times it looked like that on john gibson's face and it's not that he doesn't want to play it's that the guy is so competitive that like that just hurt him mentally and physically i think it just you know it tired him out and that sort of thing so they need to give him a little bit more of a break and you know you can look over to montreal i think bringing in jake allen in mm-hmm. order to benefit uh carry price right which it totally did going into yeah, the playoffs it right did. so give anthony stellars a few more starts give john gibson a few less it's gonna suck for him for a little bit but i feel like that would you know help the team substantially it's not gonna be as a compact schedule as you had the last couple of seasons there's still an olympic break still a christmas break they're going to need to rely on two guys, so still Lars is a guy to watch out for, for sure. I really like John Gibson, and I really hope he can push Connor Hellebuck to be the U.S. starting goaltender at the Olympics. Uh, yeah. That's going to be an interesting race we see if the NHL obviously goes to the Olympics. Ricard Raquel is the last point here I want to talk to you about Anaheim. This guy's name has been in and out of trade rumors for what seems like three or four seasons now. Where is Ricard at in his career, and where are the Ducks at with Raquel? I feel like the Ducks, not that they don't want to keep him, but they want to be able to attain the like the most that they can for him right now because I don't know if they see him staying past uh, this season. He will become a UFA in twenty two twenty three. Mm-hmm. You want to be able to get as most as you as much as you can for this guy. Um, he is still a guy that can you know put up goals, put up points. He's twenty eight years old. Um, he can play both sides of the wing. And, you know, if you're taking on just for one year, he's at a 3.789 cap hit, which for a lot of teams and for, you know, his point, uh, the points that he gets, it's a pretty good deal, honestly. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they want to, I think it's just more that in order to attain the most that they can for him, they would like to move on. It's a good way to put it. Uh, he would look really good in uh, in a couple of different spots. Thinking around the league of places he'd put really, really good. The, a team like the Avalanche come up for me when it comes to Raquel. Sliding on that second line there doesn't have to be a guy required to be the offense. He can do a nice secondary scoring and be really good at that kind of thing. And I think he'd pair really well with Nazem Kadri. That's my mm-hmm. dark horse pick for Raquel if he gets moved. Um. So we go from probably the most boringest of off seasons to a team who had a really strong off season. It's not that they did a ton of things. It looks like they just did the right things. The Los Angeles Kings had a strong off season. In my opinion, they bring in a nice defender leadership on the back end and Alex Edler. They bring in one of the highly touted centermen in Philip Deneau. He's not known for his offense, but as a two way game slides in behind probably Kopitar and maybe Byfield. Nice depth move for them. And they just go and they sign their guys back again. What did you make of the moves this offseason for Los Angeles thus far? Los Angeles over the last couple of seasons, I would say, have quietly gone from rebuilding to competitive, I'll say. I won't mm-hmm. say contender, but they're competitive. They're going yeah. to be a team that you have to look out for each night um yeah i did have uh deno written down here a pretty nice contract a little bit of overpay but it was free agency at six years at 5.5 million per but you know for a shutdown guy that um you know was it honestly he should have been in the selkie running last year i think Mm -hmm. um that's not a terrible deal and it's a good piece to build around right um they were able to also keep andreas athanasio uh, mm-hmm. For one more year at uh, 2.7 million. That's a guy that I honestly really like. I'm not honestly, I, I don't even know what to pick exactly about him, but you know, from Detroit to Edmonton to LA, just this guy has just been somebody I enjoy watching. I'm not yeah. sure what it is, but um, so yeah, they get one more year of him there as well. And uh, 
yeah, just the, the team quietly is just, yeah, competitive. I'm just taking a look here at uh, Daily Faceoff and just kind of their projected lineups. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're starting with Anze Kopitar, Victor Arvidsson, and uh, Alex Ayafalo. Going to that second line of Philip Deneau, Dustin Brown, and Adrian Kempe. That's a pretty good top six, honestly. Yeah, it it's, is. It is that bottom six that starts to fall just a little bit. You know, kind of the the main points to me at least are they have Quinton Byfield actually listed here as the set as the third line center with Andreas Athanasio and uh, Trevor Moore. But yeah, you're starting to fall off at that point there. Um, their defense is a little questionable, I would say as well. Um, but you know, still you can still make it work for sure. Drew Doughty, uh, and like you said, they picked up uh, Alex Adler as well, uh, bringing in some leadership, some more leadership, yeah. especially for uh, you know. I feel like they're going to have actually a lot of younger guys uh, yeah. on this team, like even more so than last year. So, and uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, they got still Jonathan. Yeah, it's Jonathan Quick and uh, Cal Peterson yeah. uh, in net there. Um, Peterson just slowly taking on that starting role mm-hmm. and you know working with it. He's been he's been great for them, honestly. So he's been really good, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like honestly, LA is a team that you you might have to watch out for. I think actually, they, like I said, they're they're in a spot to be competitive. And taking a look at uh, you know the West Division last year, there was kind of those teams that you're like, okay, these are the ones that are for sure going to be there, but like kind of who's mm-hmm. going to fill out that for that third and fourth spot. LA was in that running for the fourth spot for the longest time, just yep. very quietly, honestly, until they went on a bit of a losing skid there and uh, ended up in six out of eighth uh, for that Western division. But they were, they were looking good. They were a team that you, uh, yeah, you had to make sure you were ready to play against. So the big thing for me for Los Angeles is they didn't lose anybody. Mm-hmm. They had one UFA in, in Luff who left for Nashville, but they didn't lose anybody. They didn't lose any of their core. They didn't lose any of those young kids that they love. And even in the expansion draft, they didn't lose anybody. They have the same guys coming back, learning again, and it's the same coach. It's another year under Todd McClellan. Does he get enough love for you around the National Hockey League? Not as much, but he, like this, like the rest of this team, is just – quietly doing his thing honestly um you could almost say he was actually one of the better coaches that edmonton has had over the last 10 years <laughs> like doing <laughs> at least something with the team and with how edmonton was and everything like that if you can do something with that I'd like to think you're pretty good honestly at what you do so yeah i really like him i like what he does there um i wanted to also touch on you mentioned him earlier victor arvidson it's kind of a sneaky pickup for me what does he bring that los angeles desperately needed besides just the goal scoring maybe a little bit of leadership your take on the move to bring in victor arvidson uh he does yeah like you said he, he brings in a little bit of leadership there he also brings uh you know hopefully a little bit more scoring as well for the la kings uh and adding some depth to that right side because there's not a whole lot there at least for the time being until some of their younger guys develop all right let's go to the i'm calling the third biggest mess in the national hockey league <laughs> uh, I, that literally my first note on san jose is what a mess with the big long expensive defensive contracts not a lot of prospects because they always always going for the playoffs and trying to be deep in the playoffs. They didn't really have a bad off season though. They they revamped their goaltending. They brought in a couple of veterans. But what do you make of San Jose this off season so far? I'd like to just publicly apologize to Eric Carlson as you know he said last year that he didn't come to San Jose to be in a rebuild. Sorry, buddy, you're in the middle of one, whether you like it or not. And you're gonna probably stay um, the whole time. Yeah, exactly. At least, at least you're making your money, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, it's. I feel like it kind of. I'm trying to think of like the actual timeline of everything, but I feel like the big, uh, you know, obstacle that got uh, kind of got moved out of the way was the buyout of Martin Jones, just to get a fresh mm-hmm. start in the crease. They bring in Aiden Hill, uh, also avoiding arbitration with him, uh, yeah. at a uh, two year, two point two five million dollar contract not horrible and bringing back James Reimer, who's another reliable goaltender uh, for his second run in San Jose there. Same thing at 2.25, mm-hmm. uh, just adding the mod- the modified no trade clause there. He gets, uh, I believe it's five teams, uh, five team, no trade list. Um, 
yeah, you're set with your goalies for the next two years. That's not a horrible tandem. It's not the greatest, but it's not mm-hmm. horrible. Yeah. As long as you can play in front of them, it should be all right. Um, I don't know. I have here that it was a little bit more. They added age, I thought. Uh, yes. The big guys sticking out to me were Nick Benino. You know, he's 33, adding him for a two-year contract, which isn't long, but it does take him to 35. And uh, same with Andrew Cogliano as well. Only a one-year deal at one million. Pretty good bang for your buck, but the guy is 34 as well. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you'd think that this team would be trying to bring in some more, like some more youth than what they slowly have been trickling down the pipeline and whatnot. But, um, you know, I feel like that uh, that youth there just needs a little bit more time, and uh, you know, they could be competitive again soon here. So, but I. Unlike the LA Kings, I wouldn't be calling them competitive just yet, but we'll see what happens. I don't, I might be a skeptic here, but I don't see a way out of this for San Jose other than running out those contracts on the back end. People still love Brent Burns. Fine. I get it. Mm. People still love Eric Carlson for the most part. I get it. But those contracts are only going to get worse and harder to move the longer they go on. Unless they can find another Arizona out there just to take on some contracts, it's going to be hard to rebuild this team because there's not a lot in those cupboards from all of those moving of first-round picks or drafting very late in the first round from all that success. And then add on top of that, those moves they made with Ottawa that ended up biting them in the butt with the high picks going to Ottawa. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a lot there for San Jose to try to unpack. But... They have a really good coach, an underrated coach in my books. Wanted to ask you about Bob Bugner and what you've made of the job that Bob Bugner has done in his National Hockey League career thus far. Uh, at least in terms of the San Jose Sharks team uh, last year, he did the best with what he had, right? Like you said, you got a, an aging back end. That's not going to be great for anybody right (laughs) um especially when you know your top paid guy on the back end is uh having trouble still turning on his one ankle um and uh yeah and like sorry i'm just taking a look here i'm kind of man i've really lost track of time brent burns is 36 (laughs) yes he is (laughs) jesus um but yeah i mean at least for last season Mm -hmm. um Honestly, like that was kind of the start of me really knowing about him. So I can't really talk about his career as a whole, unfortunately. Um, But, you know, yeah, he made do with what he could last year. Got a few wins in places that uh, I don't think even Sharks fans were expecting and that sort of thing. So um, really, I feel like for this team, it can only go up from here. Now, it's not all doom and gloom for the Sharks. There is a couple things I want to highlight. They have a couple of really nice pieces. Maybe just what you see out of Thomas Hurdle for the San Jose Sharks and how he can be a building block for that team. And then a similar question, same thing really for uh, Timo Meyer as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Timo Meyer is somebody you can definitely build on for the next few years. He's still young at 24 um, and, uh, you know, can play both sides of the ice as well, right? Like uh, mm-hmm. left wing, right wing, right? So you can put him anywhere that you need to to, to bolster any lineup. Um, and yeah, Thomas Hurdle. As a, yeah, as a great leader, he's yeah 27 years old. They're going to have to, you know, try to re-sign him again. He's a UFA after this season. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, hopefully they can do that. Uh, and, you know, if they were trying to move him or that this year, if, uh, excuse me, if, uh, you know, it seems like he doesn't want to re-sign, it's going to be a little bit more tough as he does have a modified no trade. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sure... It, it seems like he would like to stay, obviously, but and that you know the Sharks would like to keep him, obviously. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll definitely be uh, interesting to see how this season goes. I think uh, once we kind of hit, I feel like January, we might have an idea of uh, you know mm-hmm. how much longer Thomas Hurdle potentially has in San Jose. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to test your allegiance to the Ducks as well. We, All right. It's probably not San Jose. I think I know where we're going to go with this answer. Which of these three teams for you is most ready to get back into that conversation of we're going to be a playoff team? We are in this battle with Edmonton and and Vegas. We are part of this battle. Who for you is the closest for this? Sorry, can you repeat the question? You cut out just for a second. No, no problem. Okay, so we have these three teams. Which of these three is the closest to putting themselves back into that conversation in the elite of this division for the playoff race to say, we're going to take on the Vegases, the Edmontons, the Calgarys. We're going to be part Ooh. of this race. 
Got to test your allegiance to the Ducks yeah. and see if you're going to go the way I think oh, you're going to go. Obviously, I want to say the Ducks, but they need a little bit more time. I got to go with the LA Kings. Like I said, they've just been quietly going from rebuild to competitive. Uh, you know, they kind of showed the West at least what they could do last year and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I, 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 as much as it hurts me, I got to go with the Kings there. <laughs> I, I'm a, I agree with you there. I think that the Kings have a lot of good pieces. I've liked their offseason, and I really like what Cal Peterson brings. There's zero pressure on either of those goaltenders there as well. And uh, of the three coaches in that that state I, I think they have the best of the three coaches as well so awesome interesting conversation there we want to continue this preview type thing going forward here but we're gonna go back to something we talked about last week that i talked about with audi james i wanted to get your thoughts as well on the seattle crack and so first off your excitement level for the 32nd team coming into the league uh really excited you know it seems like uh I, I, I would have thought that Seattle would have had a team before Vegas, so I'm very happy that they're finally getting a team. And they do have the NHL history, whether people know it or not, right? Like, yeah. there has been a Stanley Cup in Seattle. So when they say bring the cup back to Seattle, I know there's going to be a lot of uh, people who are like, you know, not like the like the non-history aficionados, <laughs> I guess, or like, bring the cup back. What are you talking about? But uh, yeah. the old Seattle Metropolitans, so... Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's maybe not quite the same hype as the Vegas Golden Knights initially. Um, but I think, you know, Vegas had a bit of an edge there where, you know, the last expansion team was in 2000 or 99, one of those years. Um, but so there was a lot of time in between, right? Mm -hmm. For something new. The only other thing that we had had during that time was a relocation of Atlanta. Sorry for losing your second team to back to <laughs> like to Winnipeg, right? So um, so you have a little bit of they, like Vegas had a little bit of the edge in the excitement department there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, Seattle just, you know, with the, the stuff that they kind of have going around uh, with them, the hiring of Ron Francis as their GM, right? You start off with a uh, with a championship pedigree in uh, in there, uh, even just down to the arena, honestly, and kind of being a little bit of a little bit of a nerd like just knowing that like it's gonna yeah. be like the like one of the first like self-sustaining arenas that's kind of cool actually it's very cool they're, they're paving a path and that sort of thing so yeah there's there's it's not the overall same excitement as vegas but there's a lot of things to be excited about whether it's the team specifically the roster or just anything surrounding it how high on your wish list is a third seattle jersey that is an homage to the stanley cup champions Ooh, I actually haven't thought of a thought of it doing thought of them doing that, but that would be really cool. But I'd love to see something that you know invokes that almost kind of a reverse retro idea that some of the teams mm -hmm. did of you know taking the modern colors, putting it on uh, an older jersey. Um, I think that would be really cool. Actually, kind of a kind of a barber pole, not as ugly as the Montreal ones were for their <laughs> but uh, something something like that. I think could be really cool actually. So, but uh, we probably won't be seeing that till. Uh, at least next season, obviously. Yeah, of course. It's high on my list. I really kind of hope they do it, and I really kind of hope they do the ugliest version of it, just just for fun, <laughs> just because I'm Team Chaos and I love that kind of yeah. stuff. I think I think the big thing for me for a third jersey that I would love to see, and it's something that I'm kind of disappointed that Vegas didn't do, is use their secondary logo because both teams have honestly Tremendous. brilliant, I think, secondary mm -hmm. logos. Vegas should have been using the, you know, the the star and swords. Luckily they did mm -hmm. use it for the reverse retros and that Jersey looks beautiful. That one should mm -hmm. just be part of the rotation if they could. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, the Seattle one is so it's so simple, but there's just like, there's just little tidbits to it, right? You have, you know, the anchor for the ocean and everything like that, but just subtly in there is the space needle. And I, I just think that's beautiful. It's awesome. I think Seattle net nailed everything off the ice perfectly. The, the logo, the, the arena, the marketing of the team. Then we get to the expansion draft, and Ron Francis throws a curveball into everything where he's he went after cap space. He didn't go after the best team he could have drafted. He went after cap space. What do you make of that strategy from Ron Francis? Uh it's it was definitely bold, but it's seemingly paying off already. Um, yeah, he 
what I think he had like thirty million dollars that he could have played with yeah. after the uh, the initial draft, and obviously there was guys that you could tell were not going to be on the opening night roster. They were just to you know be able to pick somebody, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, you know, yeah, like they they yeah they were able to use their cap space as a weapon. They have done it during free agency, and they can still do it. They still have nine point two four million dollars mm-hmm. that they can play with come trade deadline you can utilize that for a lot in, like, in a lot of different ways uh depending on you know what you might need or that sort of thing um and uh yeah you know like the the big signing i think to me is that philip grubauer uh mm-hmm. signing uh you know kind of just sweeping him away from colorado um i know that took a lot of people by surprise that signing because yep. you know we're you're having the kind of leaks of the Dreger co- uh, contract come out before the uh, expansion draft even, right? And so mm-hmm. it's like, okay, yeah, Dreger is going to be the uh, be the starter, right? You would you would think, and they picked up um, that young goaltender from Washington. I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now. I feel really bad about that, but um, Vanacek, Vanacek, yeah, right. And uh, but you know they bring in Grubauer, and suddenly you have a deadly tandem there mm-hmm. uh, yes. that could do a lot of damage this i feel like this team just taking a look at the initial just kind of the roster we have at the moment on paper um they can obviously they're obviously going to be able to put up some goals but i think they're going to be really good defensively mm-hmm. yes um, you know with that back end of grubauer and drieger and uh i'm sorry i'm just pulling up the the lineup again but just like uh-huh. off the top of my head you have um you know Hayden Flurry, which I did like him for the small time that he was in Anaheim, and I'm a he, big was, fan. he was good. Yeah, he was good in Carolina. I'm a big uh, fan of obviously. his brother too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I guess you have, yeah you have both the Flurry brothers there. Yep. Um, I I was kind of laughing. I had, buddy, I had a buddy message me during the expansion draft, and it's like, okay, at this point, if you're an expansion team, it seems like you're required to take a guy with the last name Flurry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and you also have, um, you know flames legend forever a flame mark giordano uh whether he looked like he initially wanted to be there or not which obviously <laughs> it sounds like he didn't but um you know it sounds like he's uh he's he's come into accepting it and uh, that's a tough to situation help. for him yeah it's, yeah it is for sure um sorry i finally got the no problem up here. uh yeah you know like vince dunn adam larson and that larson one you know made Oilers fans pretty upset, but when the kind of the reasons started coming out as to why he potentially wanted to move away, it kind of made sense. Um, yep. Just like, I mean, even the pressure alone of being traded one for one with Taylor Hall and having, you know, Edmonton is obviously a passionate fan base. They are going to be mm-hmm. hard on him. And it's so hard to compare the two because it was a defenseman for a forward. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. So Vince Dunn, he was never going to win that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Dunn, Larson, Giordano, uh, Jamie Alexi, uh, Alexiak, even uh, Hayden Flurry. It's showing here on Daily Faceoff uh, Carson Celci for now, but uh, they can easily fill that with somebody else, right? There's still some guys in uh, in free agency that could potentially get picked up. So, um, yeah, that that back end spec does look pretty deadly. So, don't underestimate Carson Celci. They picked him up from Minnesota. They left some good players on the table to take him. I, I, he could be a sneaky third pair defenseman for him. But I like mm-hmm. the job Ron Francis did in monopolizing all of that case that he acquired. You go through some of the guys, add in guys like Schwartz, Wenberg, Johansson up front. And he did a really nice job of putting together a competitive team. Do you see Seattle being a I'm going to call them a playoff team, but do you think they're going to be in that conversation of, of being in the playoff race? I taking a look on paper, I would like to say, yes, I feel like they are going to be a team that's competitive out the gate and, you know, can make a push for a playoff spot right away, especially with the Pacific division. It's looking kind of weak, honestly. Um, I think the thing is that, it's, it's, the question is going to be how quick can this team gel together? Is it going to be a Vegas like mm-hmm. situation where they just, they, they get going from the start and can't be stopped or is it going to take a little bit for all these guys who haven't ever really played together to get going? So. 
I'm excited for this. I'm excited for the natural rivalry that they'll have with Vancouver, and I'll, I'm excited to watch that puck drop for Seattle. It's going to be very interesting to see how that team plays on ice because Ron Francis, again, he his way, he went out and got his coach. What do you make of Hackstall, the coach of the Seattle Kraken? I think it was a great pickup. I am kind of surprised, honestly, that they didn't get um, – oh, why am I blanking on his name right now? Man, you can tell that I'm fired, right? Um, was the Vegas yeah, coach. Yeah, it's okay. In Florida. Um, Gerard Gallant. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, I am tired. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I felt like that was kind of like the storybook pick, right? Of like, oh, yeah, he was the guy who yep. just did the last expansion. He took him to a Stanley Cup final. Let's get Gallant. But, uh, yeah, Hextall is a... As a great coach also, I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how he operates with a brand new team that, you know, from the start doesn't have any mm. chemistry. All right, let's go off the rails a little bit here. Let's have a little bit of fun with this. Does Seattle have enough capita and cap space to be in the Jack Eichel conversation for you? Oh, geez. Uh Okay, I'm taking a look at cap friendly here. I just want to take a look at what their future, like what they have to fix still. Because I don't. Well, I don't you think do that. I'll jump in. Well, you, picks, are they? No, I'll, I'll jump in here while you look that up. I think they can be. You look at the guys that they drafted. They got maybe a Cal Flurry. They've got. They've had a really nice entry draft. They got a nice first round pick coming up this year. They've got some players and some pieces that could make Buffalo a better team. They have a goaltender, which Buffalo needs. I think there is a package there if Buffalo's willing to take a more of a couple of a current things to bring. And Jack Eichel would fit a huge need that the Seattle Kraken have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering if. Uh... You know, it, it seems like Seattle's not going to go the route of Vegas of, you know, we want to win nope. like five years, right? They're, they're going to be okay to take a little bit of a slow burn. So it's kind of a question, mm -hmm. I guess, if they want to go for it. If they were going for it, though, I think they actually could. Uh, you were talking about, you know, the goal idea. They could bring in, uh, or they could come to that package, Joey Decord. He's a great goaltender. Yep. I was watching. I was trying to keep track of him uh, at the University of Arizona playing for the Sun Devils, um, you know, and it was mm -hmm. a great pick by, uh, by Ottawa and, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so I think he was really that, you know, if they were to, you know, to include a goalie specifically, he would be a great option for the Buffalo Stables. Uh, taking a look at, uh, you know, their draft pick, Cattle has everything for the next three years. Uh, including a few extras. Mm -hmm. They have the fourth round from Calgary next year. And in 22, 23, uh, or sorry, the 23 draft, uh, they have Winnipeg's second and Colorado's fourth. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. Buffalo wants futures, whether they're players or not, right? Just being able to utilize a draft pick in and develop it into a player that you would like. Um, I think that's, you know, that's why draft picks are so sought after. So, mm -hmm. I just thought it'd be a little bit fun to have a little bit of a different conversation with yeah. Seattle and Buffalo. We're always hearing Buffalo and New York or Buffalo and Los Angeles. Let's throw some other teams out there and let's have some hypotheticals. Always got to have fun with that. All right. We're both in this area. We're both Flame fans. So we got to do a little bit of self-serving stuff. <laughs> Carry Flames. They've had an interesting, what I'm calling an interesting offseason. They lost their captain. I brought in Zadorov on the back end. Not a direct replacement. They signed... Uh, Blake Coleman, a big free agent that people were looking at. What have you made of the Calgary Flames this offseason? It's been a slow burn as well. I know uh, for <laughs> a lot of Flames fans, including myself, you know, the start of free agency, nobody was expecting, you know, yeah, we've traded for uh, Zadorov. Everyone's like, sorry, what now? Um, and then, you know, <laughs> it's looking like he potentially is going to go to arbitration. So it's like, okay, like, was this this is really thought through or that because you know what's his number gonna be and that sort of thing it might be a little bit higher than a lot of people and probably even the flames are hoping to spend um mm -hmm. especially you know taking a look at some of the guys they still have to sign extend right like uh for this year in rfas you still have uh valamaki and connor mackie still to sign as restricted free agents 
Um, mm-hmm. Looking to the future, you still have uh, Gaudreau and Mangiapane. Um, you know, they're still trying to bring in Jack Eichel. So you got to move some other money <laughs> elsewhere. So probably as, as much as it might suck, it's the guy that's probably going to get moved is Monaghan. Um, you know, you're trying to find then a suitor for him and that sort of thing. I think the uh, I think the guys on the in the dome pod, uh, also on the hockey podcast network, uh, I think they kind of summed it up best. <laughs> Does it seem like Brad True Living ever has an actual plan? It's a little bit scrambled right now, and it's just you know we're we're butting heads already with the cap space, and like we still have other things that we need to do in order for this team to stay somewhat relative. I won't even say competitive because you know, you never know, honestly, I feel like with this team year to <laughs> year. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I really don't know. Like it's there, there's some wins in there. Like Blake Coleman is a great addition to, uh, to our top six. I feel like, and could help with some scoring mm-hmm. is it a little hefty on the price. Yes. But again, it's free agency and honestly, it free could agency, be yeah. a hell of a lot worse. Um, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you just brought in Zadorov and it's potentially going to arbitration when you still have four other guys to sign and extend who have been longer, like here longer, obviously, than Zadorov himself. So, um, and even down to, you know, we, we brought up Mark Giordano earlier, right? Like I, I did watch Treliving's press conference after, uh, you know, the expansion draft and he was, I think it was like the opening question was like, you know, like how like the last two weeks or 48 hours been with, you know, trying to like figure out with Mark Giordano and that kind of stuff. And Trill Living is like, well, you know, we've known for two years and it's like, okay, then why haven't you done anything in these last two years yeah. if you wanted to keep him that bad? As soon as you bring in Chris Tanev last off season, you would have to think that Mark Giordano is gone, whether you tried to trade him. Mm-hmm. And even then I kind of wonder if they did try to do anything around the deadline um, because, you know, it seemed like they thought they were still going to make the playoffs mm-hmm. when everybody else had them yeah. counted out. They were just kind of, you know, they saw the rose tinted glasses on. It seemed um, I even got to the point. I think I posted on Twitter of like, okay, just end it for us. Cause they like, hung on by a single point for like a week and a half it was like just just finish it it was basically like just slowly inserting the knife right so um yeah yeah i don't know it's it's definitely been an interesting off season but still not really helping that idea that trilling doesn't really seem to have a plan here so um i'd be interested to i i feel like he won't last after this season i believe his contract is up as the general manager of the calgary flames after this season um he's got two but, years no oh yes two oh geez um but i mean <laughs> yeah like just sorry like just kind of adding on to like that idea of you know does he really have a plan or that sort of thing like look at his tenure in calgary white right? right it's been i think one first round win a play in round win and otherwise it's been you know like a like first round exit and not making the playoffs Right. When you have Gaudreau, mm-hmm. Monaghan, uh, you know, acquiring guys like Dougie Hamilton even or having Mark Giordano being the Norris Trophy winner and that sort of thing. Right. Just kind of disappointment after disappointment, mediocre, mediocrity after season of mediocrity. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, the offseason has definitely been interesting, but there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered before the puck drops in October. There are, and I get the skepticism, but I'm going to try and put a little bit of a different spin on this. A lot did go go wrong for the Flames. A lot went wrong for the Flames last year on the ice. A lot. Uh, From Jeff Ward to the power play to whatever you want to account to. But can enough go right this season for the Flames on ice under a full Daryl Sutter uh, offseason and training camp? To put the team back into a competitive state for you, back into the play, maybe the playoff conversation for you. I do have more faith in Daryl Sutter, honestly, now than I did when he was initially hired. I did kind of have my skepticism on the rehiring um, just because I thought, you know, it was a little bit of, oh, let's try to save face a little bit here by bringing in somebody <laughs> that, uh, you know, the Flames know. Um and I did kind of honestly wonder if 
because Sutter hockey is very meat and potatoes, old school hockey. So I did kind Mm -hmm. of wonder if he was going to be able to adapt to today's game. And what I saw from his time, uh, I guess his time so far in his second stint with Calgary is yes, he is able to adapt to that for the most part. Um, The only thing that I'm really, that first comes to mind is that he is still going to play Jacob Markstrom minimum 60 games out of 82. It's going to happen, right? It's going to be the same as Kiprasov. He's going <laughs> to he's going to play that that goalie um, because he feels they are the starter. But then again, Daryl Sutter was the guy that you know kind of whispered in. Uh, I forget who the GM was in uh, 2003, 2004. Um, whispered in his ear of, "Hey, San Jose has this third string in Mika Kiprasov that's stuck uh, behind Nabokov and uh, Tuscala." Bring him here and he will do great things. So, uh, you know, as much as I, you know, the, the league is moving to a tandem thing. I do still feel confident in Daryl Sutter, uh, at least in regards to the goalies. He does have to learn to give him a little bit of a break though. Cause you know, we, same thing as I was talking about with John mm-hmm. Gibson, we saw Jacob Markstrom start to get tired. It seemed like he got rushed uh, back from his injury and he wasn't quite the same goalie for the rest of the season as he was for the start of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just little tweaks here and there. And that should be fine. The rest of the team, though, once they bought into Sutter's system, and I feel like the difference between Sutter and Ward was that there was a legitimate system and some consistency mm-hmm. throughout him and there so far. Compared to Jeff Ward, who threw the lineup into a blender every second period. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, just like one like really started to, you know, buy into this like this new si- or not not new system i guess but like the sutter system sutter way um the team did start to uh you know be competitive again and that sort of thing but unfortunately it was a little too little too late so it's going to be interesting to see how the, how it plays out over the course of the season i can't wait for october really uh one last one before i let you go here we're both down in this leopard area um whl is coming back very excited for it got my vaccinations i'm right back to the rink your excitement level to get back to seeing some whl hockey as well uh has has the schedule been put out for the whl yet or or not 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 full schedule but october 1st is the start okay I mean, normally for Lethbridge and Medicine Hat fans, as I am originally from Medicine Hat, the first two games are normally a home and a home for Tigers and the Hurricanes. I know we were already joking about it on uh, Twitter. You know, our buddy Chris was going to come down, and it sounds like a bus (laughs) full of other people as well, just to come watch that game in in Lethbridge. So, um, you know, I can't wait for a bunch of random Hitman fans in the stands as I'm wearing the Tigers jersey (laughs) and you're wearing So. It's uh if if that does come to fruition, I think that's gonna be uh that's gonna be pretty good. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, junior hockey is just always fun. There's always just something a little bit about mm-hmm. like a little bit different about it compared to the NHL. You know, the NHL like is the professionals. They're you know as as fast as possible and everything like that. But you know, the WHL is a whole lot of heart. I would say these kids don't have these massive contracts yet or anything like that. They're just trying to mm-hmm. get to that. Point. And just playing their heart out, heart out, heart hearts out. So, like, I've I don't think I've ever really been to a bad WHL game. And you know, if people want scoring, definitely check out mm-hmm. the WHL because, man, the <laughs> goalies do get sunburned from the red light in that league. So, but you saw some great goalies coming out of it too. I love the Western Hockey League for the one reason of. Watch some of the biggest stars in the National Hockey League before they were big National Hockey League stars. And I'm proud to have been able to see guys like Brent Seabrook, for example, multi Stanley Cup winner, played in my hometown. And that's that's really one of the big glows of junior hockey. Nate, this has been a tough fun, but I want to give you a second here before I let you go. Where can people find your podcast at? What's coming up on it? And where can they find you on social media? Yeah, so you can uh, watch the Quack Report on uh, Twitter when we're doing our live streams, which are uh, normally Wednesday nights. Uh, once we're into the full regular season, it'll be Sunday and Wednesday nights. Um, on Twitter, uh, our um, sorry, our Twitch, uh, the Hockey Podcast Network's Facebook and YouTube channels. 
Uh, you can find the Quack Report Twitter at Quack Report Pod. I'm the one who runs that mainly, so you will be chatting with me. Um, then you can find my own social media as well at Tate Namas on Twitter, T A T E N H O M A S. And whether it's hockey you want to talk about, music, whatever, I am game for it. Go see Nate for all of your Ducks news. He's really good at that. Him and his buddy during that podcast there. He also talks Flames and Western Hockey League with you. Nate, I appreciate you joining me and making time for me today and also changing the schedule around a little bit for myself, a little bit of self-serving stuff as well. Appreciate you, and thanks for coming on the show again. Thanks again for having me. Awesome. And thank you folks for tuning in another episode of the Double Zero Hockey Show coming at you again next Thursday, 6 p.m. Mountain Time here on ASTVproductions.com. Have yourselves a great week. Out. Perfect. Thanks, Nate. Sweet. Thank you again very much. This was a lot of fun to do, so I like chatting with